Hey, welcome to April. I cannot believe how fast the semester is flying by. Um, I hope you all had a nice weekend and if you were celebrating Easter that you had a good holiday. Uh, this past weekend on Saturday was my daughter's fourth birthday and yesterday was Easter so we were just in like a wild present candy craze uh, and last night she finally crashed. It was a bit <laughs> of an emotional roller coaster in our house. Too much fun for one weekend so we're hoping to detox a little bit this week but I hope you all had a, a candy crazed fun filled weekend also. Uh, last week, we spent time talking about the ways in which individuals can be mistreated based on their identities. So we talked about discrimination, we talked about prejudice, we talked about stereotypes and how those are interconnected concepts that can negatively affect individuals in the workplace and also make organizations vulnerable. So we set up kind of the, the downside of diversity, the really negative, scary aspects of, of having diverse employees uh, by showing how we aren't always inclusive. We show how when employees are not included, when they're mistreated, the, the serious effects it can have on them and their work experiences. And the reason I do that is because the rest of the class going forward can be used to problem solve. So if we know that individuals with certain identities or stigmatized identities are subject to stereotypes and prejudice and discrimination. If we know those exist out in the world or in society or in our organization, what can we do about it? And I think starting from there is a good way to then create a diversity strategy, a DEI strategy to help the organization not only tackle those problems, in the short term, but to just longer term create more inclusive, fair, um, enjoyable workplaces for individuals to work. So um, we're starting with this approach of global diversity management. I, I shifted things around this semester. So this is um, a new way to kind of organize the class, but I actually personally really like this approach because we're now entering problem solving mode. So if we want to make our organizations more inclusive, we need to start managing diversity. And I don't know that we necessarily have described it that way in the past or in other courses. Uh, we talk about the legal reasons why we need to be inclusive, uh, or we talk about um, diversity as promoting you know, good outcomes for organizations, but we never really describe how it has to be managed. And that can make it seem like diversity is just a second thought, like it's something we do, but we don't really put a lot of value in it, um, and I want to shift that mindset. I want you all, as you enter the world as HR practitioners and experts, to really start thinking about how DEI can be part of the strategy of an organization. So I'm not sure um, how many of you have business backgrounds, but a quick kind of refresher here of strategic management. Uh, strategic management is all about focusing on organizational um, objectives, focusing on organizational goals, and identifying strategies to reach those goals and objectives. So whatever the organization says it values, it creates objectives to help it meet those values, and then we create strategies to meet the objectives. So at the end of the day, organizations are are, are, are entities that create goals, and they are aspiring to certain goals um, in the marketplace or in society. So what we need to do is really expand that conversation to think about how DEI fits into an organization's business strategy. In what way does the organization encompass DEI? How will they structure their DEI units? Where will DEI fall? So is it its own um, office or entity? Is it uh, part of HR? Where is it represented? And in what way do meeting DEI goals help the organization to reach its broader objectives? Um, and can DEI be a goal of its own? And I would say, yes, of course it can, and it should be, uh, but sometimes is not. So uh, this week, really, we're setting the tone of thinking strategically. And there are a lot of very small ways that organizations can be more inclusive and can promote diversity. But I want to start broad by saying organizations need a strategy. And if we just try to put out um, fires or problems or concerns as they come up, we're missing an opportunity to make the workplace more inclusive overall. 
So the goal is to start thinking strategically, to envision how DEI fits into an organization's broader strategic direction, and how we can use diversity goals to also meet the organization's goals. So all of this ties into an idea of what we call global diversity management, which is a collection of activities that aim to coordinate diversity management interventions of a global organization across its international branch network. So all of that is to say, we're operating in an increase, increasingly globalized environment. There are organizations that have um, multiple branch offices across the country, across multiple countries, across multiple continents. And we need an approach to structure our DEI activities. We need an approach to um, decide how we are going to facilitate those diversity management policies, procedures, and interventions. And that can take many forms. So that's really our goal today is to talk about the many forms that that diversity coordination can take. And again, we're starting broad because an organization needs to know how it's going to broadly assess and implement diversity management. And then we can move into some of the nitty gritty details. And we'll do that in the coming weeks. So there are six models of div global diversity management we'll be talking about today, the rationales model, the strategic model, etc. These follow the textbook chapter that you were assigned, um, the Johnson and Osbogen article. So hopefully if you've read that article already, this is really just an opportunity for you to hear my voice and to narrate some of that chapter to you. And so it gives you an opportunity just to have that content sink into your brain a little bit further, a little bit deeper. And if you have any questions, of course, reach out to me. So we're gonna start with the rationales model of global diversity management. Uh, and this basically says that organizations, you know, step one is that they have to identify their rationale for pursuing diversity management. So not all organizations pursue diversity management because they think it's going to bring about a lot of rewards or opportunities or even because they think it's the right thing to do. Uh, sometimes organizations pursue diversity management because they don't want to have legal problems or because they see competitors uh, engaging in those behaviors. And so sometimes we talk about diversity with an ethical imperative, and I agree there is one, but that's not always the reason that an organization does so. So sometimes an organization uh, will use an instrumental approach. And so the instrumental kind of rationale is focused on solving problems. It's focused on making a business case for diversity. So everything has to be tied back to the reasons we're engaging in diversity management, the benefits that it brings, the increases in profits or increase in productivity. It's more or less using facts and data to really support why DEI is necessary. Um, the second approach is a compliance approach. And so this is the legal approach, which involves uh, following laws, right? We have to follow the laws and regulations. We need to make sure that we're complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act. We need to ensure that we're not discriminating against protected classes, etc. This can also involve benchmarking. So organizations might look to their competitors and say, well, what are our competitors doing? And if they're doing it, then maybe we need to be doing it too, because that also can help us to be competitive in the marketplace. So um, they might look to what's happening elsewhere in, uh, in their market and see what the norm is in the industry and then follow suit um, because they think they need to, not necessarily because they want to. And then the final approach is integration, which is a values approach, which says um, we see DEI as part of our values. We see DEI as important because it's important and not because it uh, is good for business and not because it, you know legally we have to, but because it aligns with our, our values as an organization. And we see it as being a fit with our organization. And so for this reason, we're going to invest in DEI initiatives because we believe it's important to who we are and we believe it's important to the business that we're conducting. So um, those really are the three, three broad approaches that convey the rationales model of global diversity management. And it might not be hard for you to envision how these different motives for engaging in diversity management will very much impact 
how organizations implement DEI strategies, the extent to which they invest in DEI resources and networks um, and opportunities, and to which they don't. So if you take a compliance approach, you might work in an organization that does the bare minimum, right? Are we legally compliant? Great, that's it. If you take an integration approach, you're probably going to see an organization that goes well beyond that, that really works to improve the work experiences of their employees because they care about their employees and they value the differences. So um, the reason for why a company chooses to pursue DEI is going to very much affect the policies and procedures they implement, which trickle down to affect you know HR processes on a daily basis and employee experiences. Um, so that's the first approach. The second model that um, we can focus on is looking at, um, oh, sorry, this is just a, um, I got so excited. I got so excited to tell you about the second model, but this just shows you everything I just told you, but in a diagram form. So here we can see um, that diversity is a strategic choice. And I want to just underscore that, right? We're talking about broad organizational strategy, how they're choosing to invest their resources, how they're cho choosing to pursue their goals, and how does diversity fit within that? So you can see here are some additional questions that organizations might ask. So if they're using the instrumental approach, right, what problems can we solve? Can we use DEI to solve business problems? Can we use it to bring in new customer bases? Um, compliance, you know, are we following, you know, what other companies are doing? Are we following the legal requirements? Um, and then integration is more so how does it fit with what else we have in the company? How does it fit with our values, et cetera? So, once more, the approach an organization chooses, the motives they have for pursuing DEI are very much going to shape the rest of their DEI strategy and implementation of those strategies. So it's important to say that our motives are not usually stated explicitly. So a company does not come out and usually and say, we're doing DEI simply because we're legally required to. Um, sometimes we need to probe a little more by asking questions to really get at the underlying nature of those motives. Um, but at the end of the day, the approaches and interventions are very much going to be impacted by those motives. So sometimes we might need to ask questions. Well, why do you think that? Or why do you feel that? Or is this all we can do? Is there more we can do, right? Um, through these questionings, we can try to uh, undercover the, um, the motives of individuals who are leading the strategic direction of the organization. Okay, so here's the second model. The second model... Um, it's called the strategic model of global diversity management. And so here, once organizations have a motive for operating, once they have a rationale for operating, they have to identify how they're going to implement and manage those diversity policies and interventions. So they can do a local approach, um, and this involves each local branch applying its own strategy. So this is when an organization has multiple branches, um, across different regions or across different countries or continents. And so through the local approach, each branch, each entity gets to decide how it's going to um, implement its diversity strategy. So of course, this is going to create a dissimilarity between the home country and the host country. So if you have a main hub in the United States and you have another um, a branch in France, you might have dissimilarity in the strategies implemented in the United States versus in France. Uh, and of course, that can be problematic because it can lead to an imbalance in practices. So it might seem as though the organization is disjointed or um, you know, not consistent in its approach to DEI, uh, and that can lead to um, problems, I think, long term. There can also be a universal approach, and so in this way, the organization identifies one best way, one best approach um, to managing diversity management, and they implement that across all of their branches. So this approach is good because it creates consistency, right? Whatever our policies are, our values, our procedures, we're consistent, but this can lead to um, differences across national borders and being blind to those differences. So there might be um, contextual factors, legal factors, environmental factors that are impacting an organization's ability to do business in a certain way, 
um, to implement diversity in a certain way, and that, of course, can create problems. So um, something to be mindful of. And that's particularly important when it comes to race and ethnicity because the ways we talk about and describe race and ethnicity here in the United States is different in different regions or countries um, that might have a different makeup of race and ethnicities. So the final um, approach is the transversal approach, and this is blended, so more of a hybrid approach where we use a little bit of each. So more or less, we take national representatives or um, you know branch level representatives, and we bring them together to discuss priorities to develop a common set of principles. So there's more or less a representative from each branch, each region, locality, et cetera. They come together and they bring their perspectives and they share their unique views and the unique problems shared by their um, constituents. And then together a, a set of principles is created to then guide the organization in a universal way. The third approach is called the process model of global diversity management. And a process, if you think about it in terms of true business sense, involves inputs, throughputs, and outputs. So inputs really focus on, and I'll say with the process model, it's really thinking about you know what contributes to the organization, what are we giving into the organization, what, what are we creating, what's being made as a result of those inputs, um, and then what are the outcomes involved? So the inputs involved in this model, the top management team, their values and experience. So this model tells us that what's really guiding global diversity management, what's really guiding the strategy and the approach are the top management team's values and experience. So if the top management team really values diversity and inclusion, we're going to see that driving the rest of the processes through the organization versus a top management team who does, doesn't see diversity in management as a priority, that's going to change the inputs. The organizational culture is an input. It's going to have a large impact on the rest of the processes and outcomes in an organization. So what is the organization's culture? And what are the um, daily interactions like? What are the values? What are the unspoken kind of symbols? that we use the, um, the truths, you know, things that we take for granted uh, as being truths in our organization, the norms, all of that is going to shape um, the rest of the DEI process. So we have inputs and those inputs then are going to inspire some activities and the activities um, can vary. So the extent to which we include global units in our organization, how flexible our human resource management system is, um, even how we define global diversity and the, the practices that we use um, to see diversity management through. Uh, also, whether or not we develop global competencies, do we assess those global competencies across units? And then the outputs are what we're choosing to measure, what we're choosing to focus on. So things like knowledge creation and sharing, uh, employee reactions to different diversity policies and practices uh, and activities, um, performance, how performance and innovation are impacted by these activities, um, and how engaged our employees are. Are they involved in these processes? Are they excited about them? Are they emotionally invested in them? So here um, is the process model in more detail, and I think the book does a really good job describing what this process looks like, but overall what I want you to take away from this is that going back to organizational strategy and DEI being part of the strategy, this process model says that any diversity management project is really, or you know, diversity management process, sorry, starts with the top management team, and it starts with the organizational culture. And so we need an organizational culture that's open. We also need a top management team that is values diversity and recognizes its importance and is willing to make it a priority. So without those two things, um, we're gonna have a really hard time implementing some of these activities. So now um, in the middle center here is a more description of what those diversity management activities can look like and how they are shaped by those top management teams and by our culture. And then of course, um, the final right column here shows the outcomes. So what do we get from these activities? 
well, depending on how well they're implemented or depending how they're implemented at all is going to impact outcomes. So do we get employee acceptance or do we get employee backlash? Um, how does it impact our reputation as an employer? Sometimes we see when big changes are made, progressive changes are made to organizations and how they're including individuals, it does create backlash um, in the community, can harm their reputation. So what is that outcome? Uh, how does it impact performance and effectiveness of our teams and of individuals? Uh, how well or how you know seen do employees feel? Do they feel like they're seen and represented and valued? or not. So the process model says we can't just look at activities of diversity management, that what we put into our diversity activities is very much going to impact what we get out of the diversity activities uh, and thinking about that more broadly as a strategy. The fourth model um, of global diversity management is called the contextual model. And you can see here it's kind of like one of those um, nesting dolls, right? We have a context in a context in a context. Um, but more or less, it's started, it was derived from this basic understanding that global diversity management policies that are just based on the North American context, they're not going to work everywhere. But a lot of the initial research related to DEI and a lot of the um, practices that have been created are based in this culture, the Western culture in which we live. And that cannot always be transferred to other locations, to other um, regions. And we need to think about how do these different contexts come into play. So the point of this model is to say that context is layered. And that layering is going to affect global diversity management values and policies. So it's, you know, first we have to think about the individuals who work in an organization and they're going to have values and they're going to have ideas. And that's nested within the organization itself. And that's nested inside perhaps um, an industry, inside a country, inside um, you know, this international global world. So context is important because it can explain um, which activities are given meaning and support. So you know, in certain countries, um, certain movements are supported, certain ideas are supported, and others they're not. So what is the context? Um, it can help us understand the key stakeholders, individuals, and institutions of influence. So who, who is in charge or what factors are affecting the decisions being made? And I'll just give you an example uh, roughly. So in um, this coming year, in July, there is going to be a new campus carry law surrounding firearms at WVU. And, you know, in, lots of individuals have different feelings about that law and what it means for the university. And so all of those ideas were kind of bubbling up. So you have this university, I would say, generally the individual sentiment among staff and, and faculty where they did not like the law. They didn't think it was a good idea. So that's kind of nested within the broader university. And you start to see that the university itself is not in favor of the idea of people in charge at the university, people in power were speaking out against the law. Uh, you see other universities in the state also speaking out against the law. So there's kind of this coalition in um, the higher ed institution or higher ed uh, space, right? The market space, not, a, not in favor of the law. But then the context of the legislature and then the makeup of the legislatures and the political parties in power um, helped to explain why you can have individuals and organizations and industry who is not in favor of the law and it still get passed, right? We have to consider the context in which the law is implemented and the regional political aspects involved in that. And it does kind of have a trickle-down effect on these other um, entities. And so in a different state with a different political makeup, a law like this probably wouldn't be passed or wouldn't be accepted. So we can't just look at the one decision and and see it in black and white. We have to understand the, the broader context in which a situation is, is situated and influenced. And of course, it's multi-directional. So individuals can impact... Um, levels above them and you know levels up high can have downward influence um, to those contexts sort of nested under them. 
The fifth model um, is called the Intervention Model of Global Diversity Management, and this is focused on how we create interventions. So what could our interventions look like? So if we decide that we need interventions to help um, coordinate our diversity management activities, what do they look like? So they could be informational in nature, which is focused on providing information, training, and education. So telling people about DEI, helping them understand social identities, helping them understand privilege and bias and um, rules of interaction and, and ways to reduce stigma, right? All of that's informational. Can also be structural. So here, structural focuses on trying to change and develop organizational structures and processes to um, make them more fair. So uh, there have there could be an organization that does a review of its performance management process, and maybe they realize that there is bias in how individuals are being rated or how they're being evaluated. So they take steps to change the process, to try to eliminate those biases um, that might be inherent to the process. Um, are we actually using the same criteria to evaluate all individuals? Are we giving the same kind of feedback um, to all individuals? There have been some organizations where they have seen, you know, maybe men get higher quality feedback, more specific feedback about how to make improvements where the feedback given to women is more general and really less helpful in, in advancing them in the next stages of their careers. So structural intervention really says we're looking at our policies, we're looking at our processes, and we're going to make changes to those in order to make things more fair. And the final is the cultural approach. So here, um, we're changing cultural assumptions of the organization. We're going to work to um, create a welcoming and inclusive environment. We're going to challenge individuals to think differently, to start um, putting value on diversity and starting to see how diversity efforts bring us new ideas, new ways to interact and collaborate and innovate. And that, like how incredible the synergies we can be created when we bring people together. And this cultural aspect is gonna take a long time, right? Informational is easy. Structural is harder. And then cultural is the hardest yet. Um, they kind of build off of each other. But if we don't have the right information and we don't have strong processes in place, uh, then the cultural change is gonna be really difficult. So we need all three to really intervene. Um, and of course, those organizations that make it to the cultural stage, well, they're really going to excel when it comes to global diversity management versus an organization that only gives informational interventions. Well, that's helpful. It's better than nothing, but it's really not enough on its own to create long lasting, substantial change. And this is what the intervention model looks like. Um, if you can think of it on a 3D box, and I think... This picture is a little, um, a little trippy to look at, um, but more or less it's saying that the interventions that an organization chooses are going to be determined on characteristics of the organization. So um, the maturity of the global diversity um, unit. And so is it something that has existed for a long time? Is it something that's brand new? Well, if it's new, then we're going to need to start with that information, right? But if we have high maturity, then we might be able to move on to a um, more intense intervention. Leadership support and resources. You know, what leaders support is where money gets poured, is where focus gets made. So if, you know, your leader isn't really involved in DEI, if they say, sure, go ahead, but they're not invested and they're not willing to give a lot of resources or time, then we're probably not going to see as much change. Um, thinking about organizations operating multiple entities or multiple branches, um, how similar are the diversity priorities across the global branch network? So if these branches share diversity priorities, well, that's going to be easier to create change and implement interventions than if there's a big disconnect between these different branches. So I like this model and there are a lot of benefits to it. It is complex, right? That um, cube is tricky to look at and it might take you a minute to really ingest all of that information. But what this model tells us is that organizations have starting, um, have different starting points. So they're all going to be in a different place of change, just like we mentioned um, last week, right? You kind of have to start where you stand. 
Uh, this is the same thing. You have to start where you stand and organizations have to take an inventory of where they're currently at with DEI practices and where they want to go. And some are going to be in a different stage than others. And it also recognizes those contextual factors and how they impact global diversity interventions. So we just talked about that context model on a prior slide, but this tells us you know, yes, we can implement different interventions and yes, organizations are going to be in a different place. And also here are those context factors that matter, like how new we are to this diversity management um, process. What is our leadership like? What are our branches or do we have unity across branches? So um, and it really helps give a complex picture of what global diversity management looks like and how it's impacted across organizations. And then, of course, diversity and inclusion are positioned as change initiatives. And I think this is really important because um, DEI isn't just something that we do. And it's not just a box to be checked, but it's really they can be used to create more efficient, more fair processes across the organization. So we can use DEI to make organizations better overall, not just from a moral standpoint, not just from a necessarily performance standpoint, but just from an efficiency standpoint of policies and procedures. And we can use DEI to create lasting organizational change. And then the final model we're gonna talk about is what's called the house model of global diversity management. You'll see there's a picture to the right here. Um, and really, this takes into account the national and business-specific requirements. So yes, we've talked a lot about models that would occur in a global landscape. And I think you could pare those down to uh, organizations that have multiple um, branches or entities, even just in one country, and how there can be differences across regions. But this model says, yes, we operate globally, but we also have maybe national or, or regional uh, aspects to take in mind. So what this model says is that there are global priorities set by the organization, and then there's flexibility at the local level with how these can be implemented. Um, so that kind of matches that hybrid approach we talked about um, in model number two. And the activities across local units might vary. So the ways we recruit and retain employees, how we engage in development and mentoring, right? that might vary across local units. Uh, each unit might use a different approach uh, with the understanding that we all have the same overarching goals that we're trying to meet. And with the house model, um, activities are measured to understand how the organization is progressing. And we're going to talk about this idea of measurement uh, later in the semester as well, particularly when we talk about um, performance management, which is to say, if we want to know if something's working, if we want to know, if we really care about something, we need to measure it to know if we're meeting our goals or not. And that when we start measuring and holding people accountable for meeting goals or failing to meet goals, that's when we really see DEI becoming um, a central part of our organization. So we need to assess our recruitment and retention. Are those activities effective? Our development and mentoring, is it making a difference in the career progression? Supportive environment, do our employees agree that it's supportive? Do they feel safe? Do they feel included? And, and at each of these different aspects, measuring, assessing, surveying, gathering data, and using that to make informed decisions and using that data to make the DEI processes even better. So the first strategy you implement is not likely to be your last strategy. It's going to need changes, it's going to need alterations over time, but the best organizations um, that manage diversity most effectively will be those that are able to adapt uh, and make the changes that are driven by data. So the last component um, that we need to talk about is how organizations communicate their diversity strategy. So these different models, all six of the models, help us understand a component of global diversity management. And not one of these models by themselves are sufficient or comprehensive, right? They each kind of provide a sliver of understanding. They can consider them like a piece of the pie. Because the first component, say, the rationales model, well, that's really necessary to understand what our motives are and how we're going to be moving forward. And you can see how our rationale for engaging in diversity management might impact that process model, right? What are the inputs? So if our reason for 
um, engaging in diversity management is because of benchmarking, because of what our competitors are doing. Well, our inputs in terms of organizational culture probably aren't going to be as great <laughs> as if we want to engage in that integrated diversity management strategy. So you can see how each of these strategies, each of these models can be used together to look at an organization in a different light. So it's not that one strategy is the best. It's not that one strategy is you know more complex than another. It's we need to consider each of these strategies when we're evaluating an organization. And you can do that in even the case study this week. So um, what what model of diversity management are you seeing occur in the case study? And can you talk to more than one model? And how can those models help you make sense of what's happening in the organization? And how can those models help you make next steps, right? Identify next steps um, for the organization. So all of that is to say, we need to identify a strategy. We need to consider more than just one of these models when creating the strategy. And then we have to be able to communicate that strategy to other people. And the way we talk about our strategy uh, really needs to align with what we do with the strategy. And so you can see here is a little box um, of reality, right? And rhetoric. So is what we say we want to do <laughs> aligned with what top management team is actually doing uh, and what the consequences are when there isn't alignment? So at the end of the day, we need congruence between what is stated and what is done. So if an organization says DEI is important, it's part of their values, they're using DEI to obtain broader organizational objectives, well, then their policies and procedures better align and show that, yes, that's true. Um, otherwise, what happens is we're saying it's important, but we're not actually committed, and that can create empty rhetoric, right, where it seems like we're, we're saying what needs to be said, but we are not walking the talk. So this occurs, um, you know, if we're engaging in DEI, um, so if there's not congruence, two things can happen. We can engage in DEI without communicating about it, which means we're doing a lot of really cool things, but we aren't telling people what we're doing. And you need to tell people what you're doing. They need to be aware of the strategy, of the activities, of the procedures, all of that, um, so that they understand the broader organizational stance on DEI and how it fits within the organization um, and so that they just know what's happening. So if we're engaging in DEI related activities and, and management, we need to tell others about it. Um, the other the other kind of outcome is that we can communicate about DEI, but not taking actionable steps. And I think that's problematic too, because if we talk about DEI and how it's important and how we value everyone, but then we fail to take any actionable steps, well, then diversity is clearly not going to be perceived as um, a priority. And it might also impact relationships with your, with your employees who feel like they really aren't being valued. So we need to understand where the organization stands and how to change either our communication, right? What we're saying about DEI, how we're communicating about it, or our behavior, how we're um, actually supporting those DEI ideas. So we need to espouse our values. We need to share those values. We need to talk about our DEI values and plans and strategies to help encourage acceptance among employees. And we need to follow through to avoid backlash. So we can't just say we're doing something and not do it um, because that, of course, will harm the organization. So all of this is to say, I mean, I put it on a, a short um, PowerPoint here and the lecture is not that long, but overall, this is a big component of what DEI is and recognizing we can't just walk in a room and say we need to do DEI. Like, what does that mean? We need a strategy. We need to understand how it fits broad, you know, more broadly within the organization itself. How is DEI helping us reach our organizational goals? And then using these models to help guide where we're at. So where are we currently at in terms of DEI? Where do we want to be? And how do we get there? We can use these models to help us get there, um, kind of using them as a blueprint, so to speak. Uh, and then along the way, being sure that we're communicating about what we're doing and communicating about why we're doing it um, in order to bring other people on board. So um, that is our lecture for this week. And um, appreciate you sticking through here. And um, really just want to say I love getting to read 
all of your journals. I love getting to read your ideas and the questions you ask. And I like being able to engage with you all. So thank you so much for your authentic contributions. Thank you for engaging in the material and really just being invested and energetic to cover these topics. I know they're not easy. I know we haven't traditionally talked about them in other parts of business or management, but it is really important. It's important work that has a lasting impact. So thank you so much for, um, again, just your engagement and your commitment to the work. And if you need anything at all, don't hesitate to reach out. Take care.